That's my win for the day right there. All right. So um, basically, the Gospels cover Jesus's life. That's the easiest way to sum it up. And there's uh, kind of two big chunks of Jesus's life. There's the early years, which is basically like birth through age 30. And then there's the ministry years, which are like the, you know, ones everybody knows about, right? That's the, those are the common ones with his teachings and all that. Those are called the ministry years. And they're broken into these three different periods. So the period of inauguration is really covering from kind of his first miracle up to the time when he chooses his disciples. Uh, then you come to the period of popularity. So that's when he's kind of going out and starting to teach. Um, and I feel like I should hide this because let me hide that. Okay, great. That's when he goes out to teach and um, he's starting to do like his sermons, he's miracles, he's parables, you know, people are starting to know about him. So that's where he's becoming popular. Then we get to this period of opposition, which is when the re religious authorities start getting concerned because he is kind of going against what their structure is. And um, that is what ends up kind of culminating in his crucifixion because he is, he is basically undermining their authority and they're trying, trying to get concerned about um, his growing influence, which results in his crucifixion. So that's just important to know because when we go into um, the overview of the gospels, Oh, there it is. Phew. All right. All right. So we got four gospels here, right? Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the first three are referred to as the synoptic gospels. So that's because they're all presented from a similar point of view. John is, is presented from a different point of view. So that's kind of why you've got synoptic and then the, and then John, even though they're all part of the gospels. The way I like to think about this is it takes four points of view to get to the whole story about Jesus, okay? So the authors and, and everything on here is estimated, right? Cause it was like really long time ago and this is just everybody's best understanding. So what I call it here is Matthew and Luke cover his entire life. Those are birth through death. Mark and John, cover the ministry years. So those are those three periods we talked about. Periods of inauguration, the period of popularity, and the period of um, uh, opposition. So um, overall, what's important is when you look at this uh, third column here, fourth column, perspective on Jesus, these are the different perspectives that are being presented in each of the gospels. So in Matthew, it's that Jesus is the fulfillment of law and prophets from the Old Testament. In Mark, which is just his ministry years, Jesus is the humble servant. Think about it. he's that's it's all focused on the, the here and now. In Luke, Luke, what's important here is he's a Gentile, all right? He was not a Jew, he's a Gentile. So his focus is that Jesus's teachings were for everyone. Because again, that was part of kind of his um surprising ministry. Then John, John was one of his disciples and he presents Jesus as the one who transforms and unites all believers. So kind of as we go into John, just think about that perspective of he's the eternal one. He's the one who is uniting and transforming us. The other thing I wanted to point out on this slide, and let me try I'm going to try to use my pointer. This might be way too much. Okay, great. So over here, you can see between the gospels, there are 35 miracles and there's 39 parables. Okay. Note that none of these have everything in them. So that's just another piece on, you really need to read all four to get the full picture. Because there isn't, like, I remember growing up, I was kind of like, oh, the parables and the miracles, those happen in the Gospels, and, you know, they're all there. They are, but they're, they're not all there in one place. Okay. Any quick questions about this? So we got John. John's who we're focusing on. Yes. Hi. Oh, please go ahead. Absolutely. 
I don't mind anything. Take charge. I, I didn't know what you did. Yeah, you, know, you will, because we're going to watch a couple videos. Okay, so that's kind of an overview on John. Um, now, one of my favorite resources, and hi, oh, thumbs up, okay. Um, those of us who are in the adult ed committee know, and probably some who have gone to some classes I've done, that I'm like super obsessed with this um, group called the Bible Project. And it's this amazing resource. Um, and so, uh, oh, shoot. Top, top verses. Um, sorry, as I'm a little scattered here. Um, so we have um, a couple of like key themes, and this is what I was talking about a minute ago with um, his 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 purpose in the book. So there's three key themes that are covered, and then I put some of the kind of popular verses that you probably know. Um, so the themes are. Ident the identity of Jesus and abundant and eternal life through him. Then loving one another and the Holy Spirit. Brenda, that's for you. So, so key verses you probably have heard um, under identity of Jesus and abundant eternal life is God's, God loved the world so much that he gave his only son so that everyone believes in him will not be lost, but have eternal life. John 3, 16. Um, then I came so they could have life indeed, so that they could live life to the fullest. And here he's saying this to the Pharisees. So those are some of the religious leaders. And then Jesus says, I am the one who raises the dead to life. Everyone who has faith in me will live, even if they die. And everyone who lives because of faith in me will never really die. Do you believe this? Then under love one another, super famous verse, let me give you a new commandment. Love one another in the same way I loved you. You love one another. This is how everyone will recognize that you are my disciples when they see the love that you have for each other. And then had to throw this up here for Brenda, the Holy Spirit. Um, so she, here it says, but the Holy Spirit will come and help you because the Father will send the Spirit to take my place. The Spirit will teach you everything and will remind you of what I said when I was with you. And so what I love here is the Father will send the Spirit to take my place. So the Spirit's dwelling within us. Now we'll get to the Bible project. All right, so these I'll go through quickly because I I spent some time last session um, going through this, but these are, I'm like a super fan of these guys. Um, so it's John Collins and Tim Mackey. Tim Mackey actually has a connection to Madison. He got his PhD here at UW Madison in like biblical studies and scripture. I can't see my notes. So um, I'll have to, I'll find it later. But anyways, he, he got his PhD here um, and he, they are based out of Oregon. And their mission is to help people experience the Bible as a unified story that leads to Jesus. And they've got over 100 videos, I think over 150 videos on the site. Each one walks through either a key theme in the Bible or a book of the Bible. Most of them are only five minutes long. So it's like a really easy way to just kind of start to learn some of the details um, and the ability to dig in more if you want to. All right. So. We're going to go through two videos. So I said most of the Bible Project videos are five, five-ish minutes. John is so meaty that they have two videos on John and each one is eight minutes long. So that's why I'm kind of rushing to get through the beginning here because there's a lot of material. Um, so what we're going to do is watch the two videos back to back, but as you're watching them, Think about those themes that, that we saw earlier, abundant life, we've got um, um, Holy Spirit, and think about his, his lens on things, right? Is that this is uniting all believers. That's a little bumbly. Um, any, any questions before I hit play? No, okay. All right, and I, let's see, I did say share computer audio, so we should be okay. 
All right, here we go. The Gospel According to John. It's one of the earliest accounts of Jesus' life, and we learn at the end of the book that it comes from one of Jesus' closest right. followers yep. called... Yep, I can tell that. Sorry. Let me... Stop share. Oh, here's volume. Stop share. Let's turn that up quite a bit. <laughs> hey, everyone. Poor Jim. Okay. The disciple whom Jesus loved. Now he appears many times in the story itself, and there's some debate about whether it's John the son of Zebedee, one of the twelve, or a different John who lived in Jerusalem and was known in the later church as John the Elder. Whichever John it was, the book embodies his eyewitness testimony, and it's been brilliantly designed with a clear purpose that he states near the end. John says, the story is written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that by believing you may have life in his name. John believes that the Jesus you read about in this book is a lie. Oh, sorry. Live and real and that he can change your life forever. The book's design is really cool. Its first half opens with an introductory poem and a short story that's followed by then a big block of stories about Jesus performing miraculous signs that generate increasing controversy. And it all culminates in his greatest sign, the raising of Lazarus, which creates the greatest controversy as Israel's leaders decide to kill Jesus. And that launches into the book's second half. These chapters focus on Jesus' final night and last words to his disciples, which are followed by his arrest, trial, death and resurrection. The book concludes with an epilogue. In this video we're just going to focus on the first half. So the book opens with a two-part introduction. First a poem that begins, in the beginning, was the word. An obvious allusion to Genesis 1 when God created everything with his Sorry guys. We're just... Word. Now a person's words, they're distinct from that person, but they're also the embodiment of that person's mind and will. And so John says that God's word was with God, that is distinct, and yet the word was God, that is divine. And as we ponder this claim, we hear later in the poem that this divine word became human in Jesus. Then John goes on to draw from the stories of Exodus, saying that Jesus was God's tabernacle in our midst. The glorious divine presence that hovered over the Ark of the Covenant became a human in Jesus. Which leads to his last claim, that the one true God of Israel consists of God the Father and the Son, who has become human to reveal the Father to us. Now as we consider these mind-bending claims, we then start to hear a story about how John the Baptist first met Jesus, and then led other people to meet him and become his disciples. And one by one, as people encounter Jesus, they say out loud who they think he is. And in this one chapter, Jesus is given seven titles. Now these titles prepare us for John's love of sevens in designing the book, but altogether they also make a claim that this fully human Jesus from Nazareth is the messianic king, he's the teacher of Israel, and he's the son of God who will die for the sins of the world. Now that's a big claim to make about someone, and John will now go on to support it through the stories in chapters 2 through 12. They all have the same basic pattern. Jesus will perform a sign or make a claim about himself, and that will result in misunderstanding or controversy. And so in the end of each story, people are forced to make a choice about who they think Jesus is. The first section shows Jesus encountering four classic Jewish institutions, and in each case, Jesus shows that he is the reality to which that institution pointed. So Jesus is at a wedding party and the wine runs out, and Jesus then turns these huge jugs of water, like 120 gallons total, into the best wine ever. And the head waiter says to the groom, you've saved the best wine for last. Which is, of course, true, but John also calls this miracle Jesus' first sign. In other words, it's a symbol that reveals something about Jesus. So just as Isaiah said that the Messianic kingdom would be like this huge party with lots of good wine, so this first miraculous sign reveals the generosity of Jesus. So this is the period of Next, Jesus goes to the Jerusalem temple, the place one. where heaven and earth 
were supposed to come together and God would meet with his people. And Jesus asserts his authority over it, running out all the money exchangers, stopping the sacrificial offerings. And when the temple leaders threaten him, he says, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Jesus is claiming that his coming sacrificial death is where heaven and earth will truly meet together. His body that will be killed is the reality to which the temple building points. Then Jesus has this all night conversation with a rabbi named Nicodemus who thinks that Jesus is just like him, another rabbi and teacher for Israel. But Jesus says that Israel needs much more than just another teacher with new information. Israel needs a new heart and a new life. Or in his words, no one can experience God's kingdom without being born again. Jesus believes that humans are caught in a web of selfishness and sin that leads to death. But he also knows that God loves this world. And so he's here to offer people a new birth, a new chance at life. From here, Jesus travels north and he ends up at a sacred well in a conversation with a Samaritan that is a non-Jewish woman. And they start talking about water, which Jesus turns into a metaphor for himself. He says he's here to bring living water that can become a source of eternal life. Now in John, this term refers to a new quality of life, one that's infused with God's eternal love. And it's a life that can begin now and last on into the future. After this, John has designed another collection of stories that took place during four Jewish sacred days or feasts. And again, Jesus uses the images related to the feasts to make claims about himself. So Jesus first heals a paralyzed man on the Sabbath, which starts a controversy with the Jewish leaders about working on the day of rest. And Jesus says it's his father who's working on the Sabbath, and so is he. And they catch his meaning, that he was calling God his father, making himself equal with God, and so they want to kill him. The next story takes place during Passover, the feast that retold the Exodus story with the symbolic meal of the lamb and bread and wine. And Jesus miraculously provides food for a crowd of thousands, which results in people asking him for more bread. And then Jesus goes on to claim that he is the true bread, and if they eat him, they will discover eternal life. And this offends many people who stop following him. After this is a block of stories set in Jerusalem during the Feast of Tabernacles, which retold the story of Israel's wilderness wanderings as God guided them with the pillar of cloud and fire and provided them water in the desert. And Jesus gets up in the temple courts and he shouts, if anyone is thirsty, let them come to me and drink. And then later he says, I am the light of the world. He's claiming to be the illuminating presence of God and the life-saving gift of God to his people. And some people believe and follow him, but others are offended and still others try to kill him for these exalted claims. <coughs> the final feast story is during Hanukkah, which means rededication. It's about how Judah Maccabee cleared the temple of idols and set it apart as holy once more. And Jesus goes into the temple area and says that he is the one whom God has set apart as the Holy One, and that he is the true temple where God's presence dwells. And he also says, I and the Father are one. This makes the Jerusalem leaders so angry, they set in motion a plan to kill Jesus, and so he retreats from the city. Now all these conflicts, they culminate in one last miraculous sign. Jesus hears that his dear friend Lazarus is sick, but his family lives near Jerusalem, which is now a death trap for Jesus. Now, Jesus could stay away and he would save his own life, but he loves Lazarus. So once he hears that Lazarus has died, he goes to raise him from the dead and he calls him to life out of his tomb, knowing that it will cost him his own life. And the news of this amazing sign, it spreads quickly, of course, and just as Jesus knew it happened, the Jerusalem leaders hear about it and begin conspiring to murder him. And so he rides into Jerusalem as Israel's king, who's rejected by its leaders. So the first half of John draws to a close with this story about Jesus laying down his life as an act of love for his friend. And this, of course, is also a sign pointing forward to the cross, which we'll explore more in the next video. But for now, that's the first half of the Gospel of John. I know, right? Pretty, pretty light in material there. The Gospel according to John. In the first video, we saw that John wrote this book to make the claim that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son. Okay, let's just pause there for a second. I just said back to back, but any uh, quick observations? Remember, these are all online, so you can go watch them again <laughs> because there's so much going on.
Anything quick before we keep going? Give you a minute to catch your breath. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for those online, Barb was just saying it's an interesting 10,000 foot view that helps connect some of the links that maybe weren't obvious before. Yeah, Brenda. For me, I'm, as I listen to this, I have to remember Jesus was fully human. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he was doing this fully human. And I know a lot of times it's all over this guy, he was fully human. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So whatever he was going to say, we should be able to do that. Yeah. Brenda was just calling out that the key to remember here is that Jesus was fully human at this at this point too. Like this is another person doing this. And that's what we need to remember because if he can do some of these things and especially in how he's loving, um, we can do that too. All right. Okay, we're gonna kick off into part two. Son of God, the human embodiment of God's word and glorious presence who has come to reveal who God truly is. Then we explored how John designed the first half of the book to demonstrate this claim. Jesus performed miraculous signs and made huge claims about himself, that he is the reality to which Israel's entire history points. And this all generates controversy, however, and the Jewish leaders confront Jesus for all these claims, and it culminated with Jesus laying down his life for his friend Lazarus. By going near Jerusalem to raise him from the dead, Jesus sealed his fate. And so once the plot to murder Jesus is set in motion, we come into the book's second half. The first part focuses entirely on Jesus' final night and last words to the disciples as he tries to prepare them for his coming death. Jesus performs this shocking act at dinner. He takes on the role of a common servant by kneeling down to wash their dirty feet, something that in their culture a superior rabbi would never do for his disciples. And Jesus says it's a symbol of his entire life purpose to reveal the true nature of God as a being of self-giving love. And it's also a symbol of what Jesus is about to do in becoming a servant and giving up his life to die for the sins of the world. And so this act leads to his great command to his disciples that they are to follow him by loving one another as he has loved them. Acts of loving generosity are to be the hallmark of Jesus' followers. This is what will show the world who Jesus is and therefore who God is. Now from here, Jesus goes into a long flowing speech that's concluded with a prayer. And you'll find the whole thing is unified by a few repeated themes. Jesus keeps saying that he's going away, which makes the disciples sad, but Jesus says it's for the best because it means that he will send the spirit, also known as the advocate. As a human, Jesus can only be in one place at a time, but the Spirit can be Jesus' divine personal presence in any place at any time. And the Spirit will do a number of things, Jesus says. So remember, for John, the unique deity of the one God consists of that loving, unified relationship between the Father and the Son. Jesus says the Spirit is that loving, personal presence that will come to live in his people and draw them into the love between the Father and the Son. And so, Jesus says, his disciples are the ones who abide or remain in that divine love, the way that branches are connected to a vine. He's describing here how the personal love of God can permeate a person's life, healing, transforming, and making them new. And there's more. The Spirit will also empower Jesus' followers to carry on his mission in the world, to first of all, fulfill the great command to love others through radical acts of service. But also, Jesus says, the mission is to bear witness to the truth, to expose and name the selfish, sinful ways that we as humans treat each other, and to declare that in Jesus, God has saved the world through him because he loves it. He's opened up a new way to become human again. And so finally, Jesus predicts that there will be opposition, just as the Jewish leaders rejected him, so his followers will be persecuted. But he tells them not to be afraid because he has already conquered or gained victory over the world. Now, what does Jesus mean by victory here? He doesn't say, but it leads us into the final section of the book where John shows us what victory looks like Jesus style. The Jewish leaders send soldiers to Jesus and his disciples to arrest him. And when the soldiers ask which one Jesus is, he declares, I am, and they fall backward. 
Now this is brilliant on John's part. These words are the culmination of two sets of seven instances where Jesus has used that very phrase. And it all highlights one of John's core claims about Jesus. The words I am, or in Greek ego and me, they're the Greek translation of the Hebrew personal covenant name of God that was revealed to Moses back in Exodus chapter 3. It was also repeated many times in Isaiah. And John has strategically placed seven moments in his story where Jesus says, I am, followed by some astounding claim. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world, the gate for the sheep, the good shepherd, the resurrection, the way, the truth, and the life, the true vine. And John's also designed seven other stories that have key moments where Jesus says simply, I am, echoing this divine name. And so here, this occurrence, as Jesus is arrested, it's the ironic climax of all of them, because Jesus reveals his divine name and power and victory precisely at the moment that he gives up his life. After this, Jesus is put on trial for his exalted claims to be the Son of God and the King of Israel, first before the high priest and then before the Roman governor Pilate, who has to take seriously anyone who's charged with claiming to be the King of Israel. And Jesus tells Pilate that my kingdom is not from this world, meaning that he is a king and that his kingdom is for this world, but it's radically different value system, it's redefinition of power and greatness. None of this is derived from this world. Rather, they are defined by God's character that Jesus has revealed through his upside down kingdom, which is epitomized by the cross. It's the place where the world's true king conquers sin and evil by letting it conquer him. And Jesus gains victory over the world through an act of self-giving love. After this, Jesus' body is placed in a tomb that is then sealed. And on the first day of the week, Mary and then later the other disciples discover that the tomb is strangely open and then empty. And then Mary, all of a sudden, she meets Jesus. He's alive from the dead. Now, the resurrection of Jesus connects back to another pattern of sevens in John's Gospel. So all the way back at the wedding party in Cana, when Jesus turned the water into wine, John told us that that was Jesus' first sign. And he also identified the second sign, the healing of the sick boy in chapter 4. But after this, John just lets you keep count. And if you have, you'll have noticed that the sixth sign was the raising of Lazarus from the tomb, which Jesus performed at the cost of his own life. And so that and all of the signs, they point forward to this seventh and greatest sign at the culmination of the story, Jesus' own resurrection from the dead. It vindicates Jesus' claim to be the Son of God, the author of all life, whose love has conquered death itself. After the empty tomb, Jesus then meets up with all the disciples, and he commissions them by sending the Spirit as he promised, so that his mission from the Father can now be carried on through them. After this, the book concludes with an epilogue that explores the ongoing mission of Jesus' disciples in the world. So a number of them are fishing and they're not catching anything. And so Jesus appears to them on the shore. They don't recognize him though. And he tells them to cast their net on the other side of the boat. And when they obey him, they catch a huge amount of fish and it's only then that they recognize him as Jesus. Now John's offering here a picture of discipleship to Jesus. His followers will be most effective in the world when their focus is not on their work as such, but on simply listening for Jesus' voice and obeying him when he speaks. That's when they will truly see him at work in their lives. After this, Jesus talks with Peter and then commissions him as a unique leader in the Jesus movement, indicating that he too will give up his life one day. But in contrast to Peter, the last moments of the story focus on the author of this gospel, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And unlike Peter, his job was not to lead the Jesus movement, but rather to spend his long life bearing witness to Jesus so that others might believe in him. And that's actually what he's done right here by authoring this amazing story about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And that's what the Gospel of John is all about. <laughs> um, all right, any, any observations or thoughts? It's a lot. I know, yeah. He said that's a lot packed into a small amount of time.
Hi, Polly. Um, I didn't realize the written answers were so pivotal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's what kicks off the period of opposition, too, I think. I think. Can you repeat that, Brenda? Well, I, I, I think, and I'll look to our grass preacher to answer. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. Okay. And and also it's um, I mean this is really what kind of kicks off his what they said in here was um, that the that event like he was literally like walking into enemy territory at that point mm -hmm. so he was completely exposing himself knowing what the risk was but yeah I didn't realize how pivotal Lazarus was the story of Lazarus was either. Yeah. So, and for me, like the whole thing about the sevens and the I am statements, like I hear I am a lot. I know Charlie, you know, this whole Lenten season, he was focusing on the I am statements, but this helps clarify things a lot for me um, of how pivotal that is as you kind of walk through this, the story. Um, yeah, I know for, for myself, just with these overviews, because you're right, I mean, there is a ton, like these are, they're intense. Um, but I, I kind of use these a little bit as like cliff notes for myself, you know, almost like before I read a book, because it's saying, it's like laying it all out, like in five minutes, here's what you should be aware of. And then when you actually read the text, it's, it, to me, at least, it helps put it more in context. Otherwise, I tend to get my phrases, I get lost in the sauce, right? There's just like this lineage of people and all these different events that happen, and it's hard for me to put them together. So something like this helps me a ton. Melissa? Yeah. Melissa? Yes? This is Barbara McCall. I, I'm in Tulsa, actually. One of the things you notice as you read through the Gospel of John is that the the opposition to Jesus and also to John the Baptist continues throughout the entire first part of the book. Mm -hmm. even, even when John the Baptist is introduced, there are Jewish spies that were sent to watch him and report back to the Jewish authorities. And this kind of contrast between the believers and the not believers continues through the whole first part of the book and it it's very noticeable if you take time to look for it mm -hmm. the, the other thing is that the story of Lazarus does not appear in the synoptic gospels Matthew Mark, and Luke the story of Lazarus only appears in the book of John which is is very interesting to me and I do think it is a turning point it is after that that there's virtually a death warrant issued um, for Jesus and also for Lazarus. Thanks, Barb. Yep. Brenda. One of the things that's probably out of scope again, what really got me was the I am. I know God said, I am that I am. Mm. And Jesus needs to say, I am and when we introduce <laughs> so if, if you didn't hear online, Brenda was saying um, with with when uh, Jesus uses I am and his statements of I am that I am, um, when we introduce ourselves as individuals and say, I am Brenda Moten, are we being psychologists? <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to hope no. <laughs> Oh, there we go. Oh, okay. That's much smoother. Yeah. Much better. We can, we can say, uh, I'm claiming my discipleship. That would be, yeah, much better. Okay. All right. Anything you want me to go back to here at all? Otherwise, I guess we can finish early. You know, I think one thing that's the most interesting of the Bible project mm -hmm. is the timeline. Yeah. Is how it 
you know, we we hear Bible stories and verses all mm -hmm. year long, mm -hmm. but they are never in that sequence. Yep. And this really says this is the story and, and why it's told. Um, yeah. I think it's very valuable. It is, it is, yeah, agree. Nan was just saying how what's helpful about these Bible Project videos is that it's putting it in kind of a timeline of when things are happening. And I agree. I mean, one thing I've shared numerous times is, you know, I grew up in the church and I grew up knowing like, here's your top 10 hits of, you know, Bible stories that you kind of need to know. But I had no contextual understanding of how they kind of fit together. And um you know, it's like I knew these little things in pieces. And so part of my journey the past two, 10 years has been trying to actually understand the storyline of the Bible. I mean, it's been that fundamental for me of just, you know, let me put all this stuff together because when I was 10, I could rattle off the books of the Bible in order, but I didn't really know what any of them were doing except for Genesis was in the beginning. You know, I mean, there was, there was, there was very kind of, um, 10,000 foot, maybe 100,000 foot view of what was going on, but I did not have the storyline at all. And so honestly, this, like me stumbling on this, this uh, Bible project started in 2014, I think. And this, this whole site has been like a lifeline for me because I really connect with how it's telling the stories and it's the right level that I need to be able to sort of put those building blocks together. So yeah, it's great. And there's also just just because you brought it up, and you know, because you know I'm an advocate of the Bible Project. Um, there's two videos. One is an overview of the Old Testament, and the other one is the overview of the New Testament. And they're each like maybe 15 minutes long, and that gives you like the whole. I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy how much is covered in that period of time, but um, it gives you the whole thing. All right. Well, sorry for the techno difficulties and the little bumbliness, um, but we will put this on the site and feel free to reach out with any questions. Uh, next week, we're doing um, a speaker from the River uh, Food Pantry. Then we've got Brenda queued up the week after that to go through a video on contemplative prayer, contemplative short video and discussion. Um, then we will kick it into Easter. Uh, no, 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 before that. Hold on, before that. David Liners. Yep, that's right. David Liners from the Justice Project will be here. And then um, on Palm Sunday, I'll be doing um, kind of an interactive class. <laughs> so get ready to move a little bit. Um, we're going to walk through Holy Week day by day and like what actually happened and where was Jesus geographically during this time? Because he bounces around to a couple different places. So um, if anyone wants to play a part, please let me know. All right, thanks all. Bye. Bye. You too, nice to meet you.